Hello, I'm Ira Bedzo, and this is The Good Life, a show that talks about all aspects of human flourishing, from physical and mental health to social and spiritual well-being. I want to thank our sponsors for the show, the Restoring Religious Freedom Project at Emory University School of Law and Shlomo's Restaurant at the base of Aspen Mountain. The topic of today's show is, how does the environment affect well-being? And I will be speaking with Chris Lane, who is the CEO of the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. Before we begin discussing the details of how the environment and well-being are related, let's break down the issue to give some background and set the stage. A person's environment affects his or her health. This can be seen through the localized lens when we think of instances of our individual homes, workplaces, and neighborhoods and how they influence our moods, impacts our behaviors, and causes or reduces stress. It can also be seen from a broader perspective when we think about how air pollution affects asthma or the prevalence of allergies. One can even take a global perspective when we think about how climate change and species extinction affects where people can sustainably live and flourish. Oftentimes, however, we look at environmental challenges and health issues as separate and distinct. For example, the growth of ragweed due to climate change is an environmental challenge since it can hinder the growth of other plants that are important for an ecosystem. It can also be seen as a health issue since its pollen is one of the most allergenic. Each frame raises its own issues and has its own solution. But when seen through both frames, we can get a better picture of the overall effect of ragweed on our collective health and well-being, as well as which options might have the most efficacy in ensuring a healthy planet. With this setting of the stage, let's hear how a leader in environmental awareness is teaching the public about the importance of conserving the environment, both for its own sake and for the sake of personal well-being. Chris. Hello. First off, thank you for coming today. Great to be here. Uh, tell me a little bit about the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. Well, Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, also known as ACES, is a shorter way of saying it since it's a long, <laughs> thank a long you. title. That was a very long title for me to get out of my mouth, so I, pre uh, I appreciate that. ACES is a nonprofit environmental science education organization, mm -hmm. and, and that entails actually a broad, fairly broad scope of what we do. We uh, work on ecological, our foundation of what we do is ecological literacy. So that is, and that comes in many forms. That's education in schools. So kids actually in uh, this region get in-school education in environmental science and ecological literacy from educators at ACES. It's in field programs. So that's getting kids and adults outdoors to learn about the environment. It comes in the form of sustainable food. We have a sustainable food division of our organization uh, where we're growing food for kids, adults for sales, teaching the world how to grow food sustainably. Uh, we've got a forest health division where we're teaching climate change and forest health as they are interwoven. And as you know, if you've been to this area before, we're surrounded by millions of acres of forest. So we get to see that in a first, first, uh, first hand view uh, in a laboratory right out our back doors. And then restoration is our fourth kind of component of where we work. Uh, and that's actively improving habitats in this region. So I, I want to ask more, but bef before I do, I, I, I was struck by the idea of, uh, that environmental education is taught in, in schools. <clears throat> but I, I have two questions on that. One, is that innovative? Meaning, is that not taught across the country? Uh, and two, uh, if it's not taught across the country, uh, did you have to work with the uh, public school district to push for that? Or uh, Tell me more about the uh, environmental education that's going on in the schools. Well, first, as far as innovation, the environmental science education in schools today in America is fairly unique. Uh, you're from New York, you've probably seen it. It's actually some of the best schools that teach environmental science are in New York. But at the uh, elementary level, it's rarely done. Less than 10% of elementary schools in the country have science education at all, science at all. And even in this state, if you look at how the eighth graders are doing, doing science proficiency, one out of three eighth graders is proficient in science according to the state report card. So it is a, something that's unique. The in-school program that we do is especially unique because we're there five days a week uh, full time. So we're, occasionally we'll have schools that'll have part-time programs and then we also do the field trips. We partner with 45 schools uh, in the region from Aspen to even Grand Junction. We go as far out as Grand Junction to Marble to even the Eagle side of the valley in bringing kids to the outdoors on field trips, and those are science program field trips. So it is unique. Um, the country is lacking in that. I mean, the best evidence of that to this moment is 
is that when the United States is scored on the PISA test, the Program for International Student Attestment, Assessment, we are 44th out of 132 developed countries. So you could go, oh, that's in the top half. Or you can say, uh-oh, we've got a problem because 43 other countries, including China uh, and uh, Singapore, who are one and two, are crushing us in science proficiency. So our program is unique, and the need is extreme at this moment. So I, I can imagine that because it's unique, uh, it means it's not valued, or it's the, there's not a recognition of its necessity. Uh, how did ACES go about and demonstrating or, or, or persuading these schools, and are they both public schools and private schools that are doing this, uh, and were the challenges different in terms of getting this into the curriculum? Well, we were a little bit lucky in, because in the Aspen School District right here in, in town, the teachers there, many are former ACES employees. So we've got this sort of relationship with the school that we've had for, I think, 35 years now. So that, that was the starting point, was to get in the Aspen schools. We even have a dedicated classroom that's eco-design. You know, the kids leave the school and they walk to this classroom and they get this experience kind of almost outside of school. It's 100 yards away. So that was the foundation. And then from there, we've expanded to other schools, uh, full-time in Basalt, full-time in Carbondale. And the rest of the schools we're doing one-off. We're moving slowly. One of our um, strategic planks is to move further down Valley where we believe the need for science literacy is a little bit higher. So we're heading that direction. And do you do adult programs also or? We do. We've got, and, and I'm leaving so much out. I, I, I don't want to go no, too no, exactly. long. We're, we are, we are um, going okay. to investigate all of this. Okay, good, because we've got, we've got um, what, what we call our naturalist field school. Now, the naturalist field school has adult and kids. The kids takes the form of outdoor science education, as we mentioned. The, the adult program takes the form of, uh, how do I say it? It's not, you know, the old way of thinking was you, an adult will come to a course and learn something at, at our nature center, our, our headquarters here in Aspen. The new way of doing it is we're getting par uh, parents, adults out on field trips, flower birding, um, know your flowers, mushroom classes, uh, wildlife viewing, uh, nature guided tours at the most iconic places in the valley, Hunter Creek, Maroon Bells, Ashcroft in that area up at Castle Creek. Um, so that takes many forms. We have astronomy nights at, on top of Aspen Mountain. Mm -hmm. Last summer we had uh, 1,500 people at the top of Aspen Mountain looking at the stars. It was the most amazing evening I've had when you have these experts telling you um, things you never knew. So the adult program takes many forms. There's a lecture series associated with that as well, a naturalist night, which is a science uh, lecture series all winter. There's a potbelly perspective, which is a lecture series on adventure eco travel, mm -hmm. which is all winter. Uh, we have events around these things like Raptor Fair, where you can come down to Hallam Lake right on the other side of this building. Uh, we had about close to a thousand people there this summer. Uh, seeing 30 different raptors for a day where you get to experience, you know, we've got this eagle, for instance, that's been there for 33 years at our site. So, so there's kids and adult. Um, the kids, an example of that would be we do snow science on top of Aspen Mountain. So every, and I think I'm going to get this correct, it's either second or fourth grader, every second grader in the valley, um, kids that will tell you, I've never been on top of Aspen Mountain in my life, are going to the top of Aspen Mountain and doing a snow science class. They're also learning winter ecology at the same time. These are some of the examples of the many that I could give you of kids and adult and how we break it up. Right. So, you know, in education, there's, there's, there's almost like two different tracks that you can take. And they're not distinct, but mm -hmm. there's the, the education where you want to make someone uh, aware and, and appreciate uh, whatever the topic is here. It would be, you know, the environment. Um, so the awareness and appreciation is one track, but then there's the accountability and action as the second track. Because right? someone could be aware and appreciate, but not necessarily be motivated to say, oh, I need to do something about this. So how do you bridge that gap between, you know, for at least at ACES, either for children or for adults or for both, getting the people to be not only aware and appreciate the environment around them, but then be accountable to it as well? Well, it's, you're bringing up a really good question, because there's, there's two answers to it. One is that we, we believe, and we have scientific evidence to support it, indirect that that merely exposing people to nature does change the way they view the world and does change uh, their actions to some extent. Uh, an example, when I took my kids to Disney World a, a year ago and I sat there in this concrete jungle and I looked around and went, 
oh my gosh, Aces is either gonna go out of business because no one cares, because everyone cares about this fake concrete jungle, or Aces is gonna be in business forever because no one knows what we're teaching. We, so the second part of the answer to, uh, uh, to your question is, is we've got two ways of assessing that. And one is anecdotal and the other is uh, metrics that we're now tracking. So the metrics we're tracking deal with state science standards and scores in schools. So can a kid who's getting ecological literacy actually do better than another kid who didn't get it? Um, we're working on a set, uh, accumulating that data and, and using that data. Um, the other is, and I think this one's actually more exciting, is the anecdotal where I, I've gotten someone at the top of Aspen Mountain. We do ski and snowshoe tours on top of Aspen Mountain, and someone will come out and you walk out Richmond Ridge, and the person will start bringing up climate change, and you can very clearly within one, one minute you can tell they don't believe in climate change. They think this is all a joke. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the tour, they've completely changed their view. And you got to think that's affecting things. We had a Saudi prince who went on one of our tours in North Star Nature Preserve and said at the end of the tour, I've never stepped off concrete before. Wow. And you got to think that's going to have an effect. Now, this is anecdotal. We have our naturalists. You know, we talked about our educators. We've got 11 educators. We've got up to 18 naturalists. And the naturalists are doing all the guiding out in the world. And the, and the educators are in the schools. So these naturalists will come back with the most stunning stories of change. Well, and we ask them to do it at the end of our beer. You say, what, what happened? Tell us something that happened. And you hear these stories of change where people had these epiphanies. And our belief is the Rush Limbaugh's, the, not to bring politics up, but the, I mean this not as a political statement, but as an environmental science statement. And the Rush Limbaugh's and the Donald Trump's of the world who are not ecologically literate, we believe if, if we could get those people at a young age and affect their lives, and we hear it all the time. I hear someone say, I'll never forget that eagle down at Aces. 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then you look at what the person's doing today and the way they've integrated it into their world, whether it be buying an electric car, I mean, doctor, lawyer, whatever career you choose, you can integrate ecological literacy into your life. So we do hear these stories over oh, the anecdotal part. And they, I, I call it the funnest part only because it's stunning. You never get, you're always stunned by, we had the former king of Tibet visit ACES. We had the forestry minister from Bhutan visit ACES. We've had um, oil executives. We take um, uh, Senator w uh, Bill Bennett on tours every year up in Hunter Creek. And every, all these tours we do, we're doing restoration work in these areas. We've, we've, we've got place-based education where we can show people things and teach them things along the way. It's not just talking about the leaves and the, and the water, but actual work that's been done and those, the science behind it. And so, no, I'm really glad you brought up not only the Saudi prince and Disney World, uh, but also uh, national and local uh, uh, government leaders. Uh, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges, not to uh, environmental conservation, but challenges or obstacles to awareness of uh, the environment or, or, one's per or people's perceptions of how they relate to the environment uh, today, both locally and, and globally? Well, it's a tough... The answer I'm going to give you, I'm not loving it because it's, it's kind of what I said a minute earlier, but it, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is ecological literacy. It is people mm -hmm. understanding the connection between their lives mm -hmm. and the natural capital. But you could say it's ecological literacy. Okay. But there's a reason why there's a challenge for why people are ecologically illiterate. Like, is it because... Uh, People live in uh, work and live in, in offices and, and, and buildings all day. Well, is it because we focus on uh, we see nature through television, National Geographic, as opposed to looking out the window? Like, there's got to be a reason why we're illiterate, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. not just the fact that we are illiterate. Well, know? yeah, and, and you, yeah. you're touching on much of it, but yeah. but I think the number one, yeah. if you force me down to one point, it is. I'll give you two. Okay, you can take give two me points. two. The number one is is really getting outdoors. It's getting. We've created an urban environment where you can live your entire life pushing buttons, surrounded by walls, surrounded by concrete. We've got an environment where in 1980, uh, the average kid spent two hours on a screen and, and uh, four hours outdoors, and the average kid today is spending eight to 10 hours a day on a screen of some sort and less than one hour outdoors. Prisoners in the federal penitentiaries get more outdoor time than today's children. That's, they get more than one hour and the kids are getting less mm -hmm. than one hour. 
So without doubt, getting outdoors, and you see this, um, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, you could take a hunter who spends all his time outdoors, and I can guarantee you that hunter cares about the environment. Ducks Unlimited, a hunting organization, is one of the most wetland, most prolific wetlands protection organizations in the country, and they do great work, and guess what? They kill a lot of animals. If you look at our staff at ACES and see who's hunters, about half the staff are hunters because that touch with the land is, is the magic touch. And everyone who can get those uh, place-based points of connection, I believe it does change your life in some way. But the other one I'd say is ecological economics. I think we are vastly deficient in understanding the financial connections between their environment and your fiscal and physical well-being. So it's, it's financial, in other words, protection of the environment is going to clean air, clean water, no pollution. Um, example would be plastics, for example. If you've heard about the plastics pollution in our oceans, the um, multiple gyres out there, and now we're seeing the, the, that plastic, which was the cheapest way to dispose of that plastic, is just let it go, right? You let it go, it blows in the wind. But now we're paying for it, right? So no one understood the ecological economics behind plastics pollution because we allowed it to go anywhere. We allowed ourselves to manufacture it. And now if you take fish in the Pacific Ocean and cut their stomach open, and we've met with the top scientists behind this, you'll see their stomach's halfway full of plastic. So mm -hmm. albatrosses are starving to death eating plastic. Fish are dying eating plastic. And guess who's eating those fish? We are. So those same fish that we're eating now have carcinogens in them. And now there's a public health cost to that. So if people can make these kinds of, uh, and there's, there's universities working on this night and day, mm -hmm. uh, make those connections between your pocketbook and your environment, that would go a long way as well. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So uh, I'll tell you, the economic side is tough. Um, yeah. And there are, there are uh, movements and, and, and ways that people are being incentivized. Uh, but they're being incentivized indirectly. Right? And I'll, I'll give you one example that, that I, I was privy to uh, a number of years ago. Uh, so uh, the uh, Urban Land Institute had this talk once uh, with regards to LEED certified uh, buildings and how LEED certification is amazing because uh, it allows for uh, environmental buildings. But that's not what they said. What they said was LEED certification is amazing because uh, it will allow for more productive and healthier employees, uh, which means uh, that uh, you can charge higher rents to uh, companies who would be renting space, which means it's economically uh, beneficial for you to have a LEED certified building because you can gain more revenue. Absolutely. Okay. Productivity um, goes up, happier right. employees stay longer, healthier employees work longer and more productive. Mm -hmm. I'm a lead accredited professional, so I'm, I'm into that. I was doing lead building. I did one of the first 10 lead buildings in the country um, back in the 90s when it was just being done top of Aspen Mountain. Sundeck was one of the first 10 lead mm -hmm. certified buildings. So I'm, I'm, I'm into that. And that's ecological economics, though. It's, I, no, I don't know if you're presenting uh, that 100%. as, a, as I, no, I'm an supporting you. to it. Because, um, right. No, no, I'm, I'm supporting it. It's another connection, uh, yeah, uh, the, the productivity. The, 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 the difficulty with that, um, and I think it's necessary, but the difficulty with it is, uh, is it's saying that the environment is valuable only as much as it produces a different type of value for you. Um, it's not valuable in and of itself. Or it's only valuable when you can fit it into a market. Um, but some of these longer term uh, environmental challenges are much harder than to fit into that economic frame. Uh, so how do you create that type of either market incentivization uh, or uh, uh, this type of I don't even want to say like moral motivation, but social motivation on a public good that may not affect you immediately because the changes that go on in the environment and, client, and climate are much longer than an individual's lifespan. You're, you're hitting on, you're, you're good, because you're hitting on some, uh, one of the hardest, most challenging questions in the environmental movement. And that is, I'll characterize it as the silver bullet question. Everybody wants a silver bullet. So you would say the lead, um, productivity and economic implications there doesn't go far enough. And I, but, but my answer to that is every environmental issue, every context of humanity has a different environmental implication, a different environmental cost, different environmental benefit. So it is, I think it's a challenge to come up with um, 
what I would call a silver bullet solution, which is, mm -hmm. oh, well, if everyone just understood this, um, then we'd all be on the same page. It's very, very hard to do that. Uh, two examples, the Montreal Protocol that said, we're going to regulate um, chlorofluorocarbons, and that was in the 80s. And in fact, the ozone hole has shrunk. And in fact, we have found more um, better solutions. And we did it as a planet. And in fact, skin cancers, as a result of that, didn't, not that skin cancer went down, but there were skin cancers avoided, and there were implications avoided. And climate change is now the next one, where on a global scale, if we don't all get our act together, we're all going to suffer, no matter how rich or how poor, to some extent. So I don't know that there is a silver bullet, but every single issue we come across um, we're, we have to create its own scope and scale of, of solution. And in the green building movement, LEED and those kinds of things were one of the solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, if we could get to a silver bullet, it is what you're touching on, which is back to people appreciating and, and learning the most basic forms of the natural world that if people could understand, and, and, the, and this is the term, ecosystem services. So no matter who you are, you can be a billionaire in a building in Manhattan, mm -hmm. or you can be a guy on a na camping or in a tribe or a field or a farmer, no matter how close you are to the land, how far away you are from the land. The ecosystem provides the services, the stabilization of your climate, your clean water, your clean air, your stabilization of your soils, the nutrients in your soils. You cannot survive, no one can survive without air, water, and food. Mm -hmm. So we have to protect those three things, no matter which one you're in. So you could start, in theory, with air, water, and food, and we try to do that, and food's a big component for us. So, but, but you're hitting on the, the brutal, tough yeah. question. No, it, it, it's funny. It, I, I keep thinking back to what you said about the Saudi prince, was it? Yeah. Uh, who said... Uh, I can't remember his name, but go ahead. But I, I never stepped off of concrete before. Yeah. Right? So a lot of times when we, we <clears throat> talk about the market and we talk about incentivizing, uh, we, we look at a, a set of rational uh, goods. Uh, we look at it uh, very mathematically, if you will, uh, and very descriptively. Right? Um, so our trajectory is of a certain way. But the Saudi prince threw all of that out when he said, no, 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 I appreciate this just for its own sake in my own experience to it. You know, it seems as if we, like, going back to, again, what, what you said, uh, environmental literacy is, is, is twofold. One, giving people the, the, the semantic literacy of, understanding cause and effect, understanding financial implications, understanding health implications. Uh, but you can't have that alone. You also need the experiential education of understanding how that experience of being outside informs even the semantic information and that, uh, of the data set, if you will. I, I agree. I think, I think in theory, I can't believe I'm going to say this, I think in theory you could be ecologically illiterate and not have that connection. Mm -hmm and make the right decisions, that doesn't, I don't, I don't think that's wise in, in or theory. prudent, and it's in theory, right? But the, the reality, the practical reality is, the people that have the place base, um, I'll say spiritual, I'll say health, uh, these connections to the environment, when you understand what clean, some people don't know what clean water is. Is clean, what is clean water? I mean, clean, water can be turbid and be perfectly clean. Mm -hmm. It can be perfectly clear and absolutely polluted. So if you don't know basic science, you don't even know that. So people need to have those connection points so they can see what, what natural systems, how natural systems work, because guess what? We're part of that natural system, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not. Yeah, no, look, I, I hear you. And, I, and I'm actually glad you brought up the, the spiritual aspect mm -hmm. to it, because it seems as if there's been a strong movement now. And I don't know why. Um, I mean, I can venture, but where the, uh, 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 what is it called, like naturism, or like the spiritual side of Mother Earth is becoming yeah. a much stronger part of the uh, discourse, if you will. And it's either seen as a pushback of the urbanization and technological development or industrialization, uh, or it's seen as, uh, no, we need to go back to a primitive way. Um, but I also think there's a huge complementarity to it. I just, but I don't know how it fits. Um, how have you seen the spiritual side or, the, or, or, or spiritual values coming in in terms of ACEs and environmental conservation? Well, I've certainly seen a growth in what you're talking about. I mean, blue zones, um, even here in Aspen, um, um, 
all that we, we do yoga in nature now, the wild yoga. So we didn't do that 25 years ago, but we do now. And, and I, you know, I, I, I go back partly to every, um, we need to try all angles in the, in the sense that, yeah, that's, that's one approach to connecting people to nature. But I think to answer your question, really what's happening is, is, is that people are seeing this, I call it egregious, uh, urbanization and disconnection with nature that, you know, Native peoples have been doing this for, for thousands of years and now. And even we did it, you know, ask someone 300 years ago about nature. They were ecologically literate. Talk about organic food 50 years ago. There was nothing but organic food, right? So we're, we're going back to where we need to go. So I view that as a, a necessity, this spirituality, this getting back in touch with nature for nature's sake, intrinsic self, deep ecology. We, at, at ACES, we have a place called the Caddo Center at Toklop, and it's a retreat space up, are you familiar with it? Mm -hmm. It's a retreat space up Castle Creek. So you can, if you're a visitor to Aspen, you might fly in on a plane, you get in a shuttle, you go up this windy road to 10,000 feet, and it's dark and it's snowing out, and you get out and you're at this amazing place, which is essentially like a hut that you get to uh, but you can drive to it. You don't have to walk or hike or ski to get into it or bike. Uh, so this is the, that, that's the place that we're, our vision for that place is to make it uh, more the spiritual connection with nature. Well, Chris, look, I want to I wanna thank you so much uh, for this conversation. I think it's, it's quite important. And I'm glad we're having it here. Uh, we have reached the part of our show where I recommend a book that can provide greater insight into the topic we've been discussing. This week, I recommend Never Out of Season, How Having the Food We Want When We Want It Threatens Our Food Supply and Our Future by Rob Dunn. At the time when we value human diversity, we have ignored the dangers of losing diversity in the species of various crops uh, that we farm for food. While agricultural technology has allowed for increased productivity in the amount of food in the world, it has done so at the expense of cultivating different varieties of food. Uh, Dunn provides a practical and personal picture of how we can use modern technology, or, or how our use of modern technology must consider its effects on the environment so that both our humanity and our food can be resilient through diversity. We close each, uh, each show with a maxim that we hope will provide a simple takeaway that keeps you mindful of the ideas discussed. This week, the maxim is, don't see the world as simply for our use. The earth can take only so much abuse. We hope that with this show, you've come a little bit closer to achieving the good life.